Chris, all right, so uh, almost 400 now former soccer, rugby league and rugby union players who are suffering from neurological impairments have joined this class action lawsuit and it's been filed by London sports law firm Rylands Garth. So what do we know? I mean, this is just the first step in a very long process, right? Absolutely. You know, the, 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 there have been new claimants coming in all the time to join the originals. Uh, the latest new claimants include uh, 100 former uh, rugby league players, uh, 40 e extra rugby union players, some women, and 14 former footballers. Uh, you know, the footballers, this has certainly been an instance of Jeff Astle uh, case where his, his daughter has been very uh, vocal in, you know, in talking about her father's problems and that all stemmed back to you know the heading the ball and those old leather balls and but it's not just one sport and of course everybody's looking towards the nfl and we know that, that there were 4500 cases uh, and so far the nfl has paid out around 800 million dollars half of those who uh, have been paid out had dementia and they've on average the payments have been about six hundred thousand dollars each so you know that's a sort of a precedent that's been set on the other side of the pond now we've got this you know, building number of people coming towards major legal action, which their claims could exceed 300 million pounds. Wow. OK, so you know, the basic premise is, is that the players are saying that they weren't protected. Uh, World Rugby, the Rugby Football Union, RFU, and also the Welsh Rugby Union have, have all issued joint statements and they've expressed all the things that you'd expect them to express um, so is this a little bit of shadow boxing just to kind of protect themselves? Well, absolutely. You know, the RFL and the FA have also been uh, saying what they can. They're now saying, of course, if there's legal action has started, they're restricted in what they can say while going uh, into great detail about uh, what they're doing to look into the effects of concussion, look into head injuries. We know uh, each week we talk about people being sent off, Marty, because of the new rules to do with head high tackles. They're going to point to all these uh, things they're doing to try and bring into the game. And in fact, you know, there's been an awful lot of examination by experts paid by the Rugby Football Union, for example, into the impact of, uh, of head injuries and what they can do. But the claimants allege the game's governing bodies were negligent in failing to take uh, reasonable action to protect the players from permanent injury caused by repetitive concussive and sub-concussive blows. Now, if we go back to the sort of 70s and 80s, I mean, I remember watching, you know, they used to be on a Tuesday night here in the UK, uh, rugby league with Eddie Waring, and people would get, you know, knocked out, and the guy would come on with a wet sponge, and seconds later they were revived and continued playing. And it's this sort of action, or inaction, if you like, uh, by the rugby authorities... Uh, football as well to recognise that that those points those players should have, shouldn't have continued. But of course, it was a case of the magic sponge, wasn't it? And people did play on when they shouldn't have. And in fact, people like Richie McCaw had a whole series of concussions, which now you probably look at them now under the current situation and say, well, Richie probably wouldn't have played as many games. Chris Jones, Times Times Online and RugbyPass.com, and we're talking about this lawsuit. You know, how much of it comes down to the personal responsibility and also how much is this, you know, are, are, are those unions going to argue that? Because it's also, I mean, if they do, they're going to come under a lot of flack and a lot of fire, aren't they? But at the same time, I mean, they do have, I think, kind of a case for it. Well, absolutely, because we, we can all see uh, images from recent past of, of instances where players have patently been knocked out. They've been attended to on the pitch and they've been allowed to continue. And this will be the basis of, of the case, is that there was a, there was a lack of protection uh, for the players from those involved in the game. Now, of course, we also know, and this will also be part of the defence, that the uh, incidence of demen dementia in the general population is much greater recognised than it ever has been. And it's going to be a difficult, I suppose, for them to, 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 to say it's absolutely down to just the sport while, you know, there's an awful lot of dementia sufferers who never played any sport. So it's going to be a very, very difficult case. But I think that they will look towards the NFL and the, the way that that case was settled uh, as an as a, as a indication that they can win this, that the players can win this battle. While, of course, as you said, for the governing bodies, 
they've got a very difficult li uh, line to walk. They don't want to be, to be seen to be dismissing this as, no, it's nothing to do with us. And, and to be uncaring, having as that is mainly the, yeah. the biggest accusation about them in the first place. So for them, all they can do is saying we're doing as much as we can. We've changed our habits. We, you know, we, we now bring in a lot more medical information in the way that we try and uh, deliver the game to the, to the players. But the bottom line is there was a whole period of, the, of this sport and in many different sports where they weren't doing that. And the players are saying that's why we're in the situation. And, the, and one of the latest is former British Lions and Wales wing, David James. He was a winger, but he's been diagnosed with early onset dementia. And he's joined people like Steve Thompson, the World Cup winner from 2003, who has, who was, whose life has been shown to be you know, tragically affected by the brain uh, injuries that he suffered. And you know, he's, he's, he now cannot remember ever playing in a 2003 World Cup final. And how sad is that? You know, how important is it, Chris, that, that you know, that you have these names? You've got World Cup winners. You know, you've got Carl Heyman as part of this, the former Welsh captain, Ryan Jones. And now you've got the Daffod James, who's only 42, and he's a former Lion as well, only 42. How important to this case? Like, you know, would it be attracting the same kind of attention and the same kind of feelings if it wasn't involving really high-profile players? If this was, say, 250 club players, for example. Well, this is the whole point, isn't it? There's got to be a whole swathe of other players all around the world who play club rugby and who are also being diagnosed with a similar type of problems that the, that, that the professional players are. You need standard bearers, don't you, in any, in any class action, one, to get the publicity and two, to drive it on. And amongst the new claimants is a former Great Britain Rugby League international, Nick Fozard, who you know, is 45 year old. And in January, his brain scans uh, were, according to the specialists, the worst that they've ever seen. With He's also got early set on dementia and, and probable CTE, which is another major factor in this. So these guys are in their mid-40s. And this is why you know, the payments, if they are made, will be so big. Because these, these, yeah, good, hopefully they're all going to have an awful lot more of life to live in whatever state they can live it. But these are not guys in the 60s and 70s and 80s. These are guys in the mid 40s. Okay, I just I'm, I'm just sitting here thinking about this and just trying to wonder what is the what is the ideal outcome? Obviously, for you know all of these men, um, you know, trying to reverse the process of what's actually happening to them and happened to them. That's a, probably a physical impossibility. Uh, imp impossibility. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a neurologist, and neither of you. But I don't know whether you can reverse brain damage. Yeah, they can get a big payout. That goes, I suppose, to creating some kind of comfort in their uh, their last years of life. I don't want to sound all grim about it, but and that maybe goes to their families. But but what is the ideal outcome here, or is the ideal outcome not about this? Is the ideal outcome what we're seeing now, and actually the physical changes to the game so that it doesn't continue? Well, this is what the players are saying. Alex Popham, a, a Welsh international, who's also been very very uh, uh, vocal in, in, in explaining what's going on. Is saying, you know, that 90% of the damage he suffered was caused from training. And there's right. been an awful lot of examination into this, into the amount of training, contact training that players do. And, you know, in England, they have cut that down. And, you know, and he says it's not just changes to the game in the past. It's things happening going forward. You know, it's, it's, it's now, unfortunately, down to, down to the lawyers, not the unions, to, to actually find his side whether they are playing chess with players' lives. And it, it's going into the courts. And we now know of taking it out of, if you like, the clubhouses and into the courthouses. And you may say that, you know, that's, that's a terrible look for the game. But honestly, if you saw the interviews of some of these guys, they're unrecognisable from the days when they were playing. And uh, that's terribly sad for the sport. And, and, you know, action needs to be taken. Chris, also the complexities around the football side of it. They, they, I mean, how can you actually sit there and judge all three of these sports exactly the same, especially football, where you don't have the same kind of absolute physical confrontations and 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 uh, collisions. And hitting a football, I think, is completely different, isn't it, than actually getting you know tackled and having a head clash or getting coat hangered or something like that. I mean, it's actually almost something that you you willingly do. Yeah. Uh, you could, yeah, you could say that, you know, you ban heading from football. That has been discussed. 
because you know okay they've, they've changed the equipment so now the balls are not are not those heavy leather balls and i'm old enough to remember kicking one of those and boy like like a leather foot rugby ball it didn't half take its toll but you know i think that may be one of the complications which are now arising because if you keep it just to rugby both in league and union yes you can look at high tackles you can look at that that intensely physical side to the sports that cause these type of brain injuries for football you're right it's it's not the same but Rylands are very uh, aggressive in their stance on this. Uh, you know, as, you know, as, as, as lawyers, they want to get as much of a big case as they can because it raises their profile. And bringing in footballers, it's the biggest game around. You're going to also increase the amount of attention. But uh, I think it could slightly cloud what was, seems to be a very, very straightforward issue with the rugby league side. But, you know... If they can actually prove, you know, the footballs are suffering the same because of the of the heading of the ball, then they certainly deserve to stand alongside the rugby guys. What kind of timeline are we looking at on this? I know that they settled it pretty quick in the United States, didn't they? And you would have expected them over there, the way that their judicial system works and the fact that lawsuits fly around left, right and centre, that, that would have taken years and years, but they didn't. They actually did it really, really quickly. Yeah, and I think part of the reason for that was the image of the sport. You know, you know, you know uh, from your interest in the sport, it is massive over there. They, they couldn't have this cloud hanging over them uh, for longer than, 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 than they wanted. And, and they moved quickly to get it sorted. The 300 million pounds payout, you know, the, the British courts are famously slow in moving. And there will be such a long defense mechanism from all the different unions. If you're taking action against five major organizations like World Rugby, like the RFU, like the WRU, the RFL and the FA, they are going to assemble their own defense teams and they will all want their time in court. This is not something that's going to be happening as quickly as the NFL one.